Hello and welcome to Analysis with me, John Rees. The government passed a new law against forced marriage this week. The practice has few defenders, but many women's organisations have questioned whether further criminalising the practice, which is already a breach of existing laws, will be counterproductive. Experience in Scotland, where criminalisation has gone further than it has south of the border, has resulted in less women coming forward to report forced marriage. And should we trust the motives of government, whose wider agenda towards the immigrant community has, in the opinion of many, been hostile. With me in the studio are Anne-Marie Hutchinson, one of England's leading family lawyers and who represents victims of forced marriage, Mac Chishti, who's commander of North London Metropolitan Police and national police lead on forced marriage, and uh, we're joined on the line by Baroness Houdin, who's a Labour peer and a community activist, and by Anita Prem, founder and president of the Freedom Charity. Well, welcome to you all, but before we get into the discussion, let's catch up with this briefing. From the start of this week, forced marriage in the UK is a crime that holds a minimum sentence of seven years in prison. The laws have been brought in under the Home Secretary, Theresa May, who has given her full backing to the measures. Forced marriage is a tragedy for each and every victim, and its very nature means that many cases go unreported. Today's criminalisation is a further move by this government to ensure victims are protected by the law and that they have the confidence, safety and freedom to choose. Under the Anti-Social Behaviour, Crime and Policing Act of 2014, which passed earlier this year with cross-party support, a forced marriage is defined as one in which one or both spouses do not consent to the marriage but are coerced into it. The bill criminalises the act of forced marriage from taking place both within the UK and internationally. It also criminalises using deception with the intention of causing a person to leave the UK, with the intention of forcing that person to marry, and the breach of a forced marriage protection order, often used against the parents and guardians of forced marriage victims. In conjunction with this law, the Home Secretary took part in an online video by the anti-child marriage charity Freedom, where she explained why forced marriage had been criminalised. The video, which features testimony from the police, the Crown Prosecution Service, and a victim of the practice is part of a growing public campaign against the act of forced marriage. But while no one is arguing that criminalisation is a bad thing, concerns have been raised that this could prove counterproductive, as children may be deterred from coming forwards if they know their parents and loved ones face criminal prosecution. The question then is whether tougher penalties will solve a growing problem in society. Nathaniel Lema Sansom, Islam Channel. OK, so, Anne-Marie, uh, will this change in the law make any difference or might it be counterproductive? Well, it, it's a very complex issue. Um, it will inevitably make a difference. What that difference will be, um, we're going to have to wait and see. Um, whether it will be counterproductive, that will depend on how it is implemented. Um, as I say, it's a very complex issue. The issues surrounding forced marriage, um, control of young children, children um, young people, it is not one motivation. There's not one motivation for it. So we've got to understand what are the motivations and what's happening. But at the same time, we need to understand from those young persons' point of view how they feel about it and, and to respond very sensitively. But what is clear, it is law and we must make sure now it works. Mm. Mac, I mean, uh, from, from your perspective, surely this is the, the, the last resort, is a, is a legal one here. It's the, it's, the, it's the last thing that you want to call the police on, isn't it? Well, what we want to do is really eradicate this because it is a harmful practice. Condemning a girl or even a boy to a life of torment, uh, rape, enforced pregnancy, servitude, all those things are wrong in any religion, in any custom. And indeed already illegal. Well... Forced marriage is now illegal. What we had before was a number of circumstances which could have ranged from threats, harassment, to violence, to kidnap, to murder. Individual specific offences were committed. But now what we've got the opportunity is to put this before a court, a civil court, or a criminal court, as a forced marriage, as a criminal act of forced marriage. And I think that's really important, and that's symbolically important, as well as practically important. Mm. Baron Zudin, uh, you were a chair of, a, of an earlier committee which looked into this. So, so what's your take on, on this piece of legislation? I with uh, both the speakers. I think we, all of us, wholly condemn forced marriage, which is the end product of a number of uh, sort of leading incidents which lead to uh, parents committing an act of forced marriage. I, I, the work that we did clearly um, indicated that there were recognitions, but there weren't enough recognitions within the community. And I think, by and large, over the last 10 years, things have 
remarkably changed with leading organizations, women's organizations, a faith organization, recognizing that this is a real issue and that it's not to be tolerated. I agree wholeheartedly with um, Anne-Marie Hitch- Hutchinson that it is a very complex issue, and uh, um, we don't yet know whether the legislation in place uh, to make it criminal uh, um, criminal um, activity uh, will be counterproductive. What I do know is that a number of us, including Baroness Scotland, myself, uh, Baroness Hossein Eche, we uh, um, oppose the legislation being criminalized. At the time we were chairing this, uh, I was chairing this committee, what we proposed was to make it part of the overall uh, legislation on violence against women, child protection, kidnapping, murder, etc. And I think what uh, Mark, Mark Chisty says is very important, that I think what has been done with criminalization is, is kind of make it symbolic, which I think it's, you know, many organizations says rightly that it is simply to add to the criminalization of certain sections of the community. I think what we need to do is make sure that, you know, the law is enforced, and now that it is, but we also ensure that at the same time there are resources to support uh, those who are fleeing uh, forced marriages in any case, as well as ensure that you know communities are educated about the law so that they don't end up committing this you know terrible crime, there's terrible oppression of uh, young women in particular. Okay. Uh, Anita Prem, uh, do you think that one effect of, of changing the law like this and the publicity that's attended it will, will be to make people believe that it can be dealt with as a primarily as a criminal question rather than perhaps through education and an and argument about the, the, the culture that surrounds it? I think one of the things that are very clear on this is there isn't just one solution to look at forced marriage. The, the Making it a criminal offence is one way forward. The other way forward is looking at education. That has to be a crucial area, not only for this generation, but future generations coming up. I mean, as a charity at Freedom, we have a national campaign around going into schools, colleges and universities and talking to young people and teachers around the dangers of forced marriage, what signs to look out for and what they should be doing to prevent it, and also changing hearts and minds of future perpetrators that could be thinking that this is okay to force their sisters, cousins into a marriage and what it actually leads to. Okay. Um, Anne-Marie, do you worry that, you know, when a piece of legislation goes through like this, it's inevitably attended by quite a lot of publicity, whereas some of the other work, the cultural work or the educational work, you know, nobody gets on the news headline and says, wow, there's been a fantastic educational programme launched here. I think, as Anita said, they they go hand in hand, and you can't just have one part. And and this criminal criminalisation can't stand alone. And there will be many cases where the criminal the criminal law will go hand in hand with the civil law, with protective measures. It may be in certain situations it will involve child protection law, um, the care process, social workers, etc. And then the wider the wider spectrum is the cultural work and the work within communities and with the young people themselves. But what I do want to say, I think, is very, very important that the, the concept of young people being reluctant to come forward to report their parents, we must be very vigilant that that is not hijacked as a reason not to have this legislation by the perpetrators and would-be perpetrators. And I, and I have a great concern that I've heard it said by people who, who are against this law but um, unlikely themselves to be victims, potentially could be perpetrators who say, well, the young people won't come forward and it, we must not allow that to happen mm. because it's not the young people shouldn't feel ashamed in coming forward. The perpetrators should feel ashamed that their young people have a need to come forward. Mm. But do you think that's a, a, a reasonable argument being used by unreasonable people? In other words, is there genuinely a concern, quite apart from what perpetrators well, might course, say? Of course, these children... You know, these, the, the, difficulty with forced marriage in this whole scenario is these are the perpetrators and the people involved in what's going on are the people who love you most, who you expect to love and protect you. And if you're a victim of a crime outside of your family, you have the support of your family through the whole process. But here the perpetrators are your family members, be they immediate family or more extended. And of course there will be difficulties for young people. They may be momentarily have lapses where they, they feel they can't sustain the position, um, even though they're themselves at risk. So the other side of the coin is, is, 
as Matt said, they must have support as part of the system, whether it's through victim support, special counselling, um, trained police officers, trained um, Crown prosecutors. We, ha we have to have the support for those young people because it will be naturally difficult for them to continue with a prosecution and be a witness. Mm. I mean, Mac, are you, are you worried that, you know, uh, the, some of the evidence from Scotland seems to suggest that when there's a greater degree of criminalisation, there's less reporting of it? Some of that may be for the reasons that we just discussed with Anne-Marie about people not wishing to sort of put their families in the frame or mm. that the effects on them of putting their families in the frame uh, m might, be, uh, might be disadvantageous to them. Are you worried that there's a question, though, about how much people trust the police in coming forward? I think I think the police. I think the public should trust the police because well, we've become really experienced in this. Yeah, I expect uh, you to say that, yeah, but, but, but some of the evidence is that they don't. So is that uh, a factor? Okay, if. If we have a look at when this was announced as becoming a criminal act so about a year ago, helplines, where the, the calls to helplines actually increased knowing that. So, so I don't think it was necessarily a hindrance to that, although I do take on board we have to be vigilant and very sensitive around that. Well, I would like to just uh, come back to your earlier point. I think there's three things that we need to accomplish to eradicate this as a form of harmful practice and that is prevention and we're doing pretty well in terms of educating and making sure people take personal steps to make themselves less likely to become a victim. There's the education side and that's not just education for a victim and an offender, it's for a whole in community because when communities come together the pull for a community to start whispering and campaigning and asking questions, oh that girl's now 22, she hasn't been married, I wonder what's wrong with that. Those are very things that drive these type of behaviours which are really harmful. And the last thing is about enforcement. Those three things go hand in hand. And enforcement too now, yes, we could have enforced a law of criminalisation in terms of harassment or threats or violence, but this is now very categoric, it's very clear. It's against the law, it's up to seven years, it's a forced marriage, and I think that's the penetrating message we have to land, and this is why it's so important that we come on shows like this to make sure that we do drive it home. Mm. Baron Sudin, why, when you were involved with this, uh, did you did you not come to the same kind of conclusions as the government has obviously come to now? Um, definitely not. I mean, I, I think at that time in '98 we were uh, wanting to ensure that communities of different faiths, different parts of the country, including Scotland, are absolutely aware of their responsibility in, in, in the communities, that forced marriage is not acceptable in faith, in law, any of it. And, and the oppression of young people is, you know, not, not something that's valued by, you know, good communities. That's one thing. What we were saying is that civil litigation was um, adequate enough um, to enforce, uh, you know, um, parents to the legal system. That's what we were arguing. And very good argument was put forward by the former Attorney General, Baroness Scotland. And I do think that, you know, this symbolic gesture of sort of punitively punishing certain sections of the community is a really very uh, powerful argument. Nonetheless, we actually have the law now, and we have to ensure that, you know, um, the law persists and that uh, perpetrators are brought to justice. What I'm very, very concerned about is trusting the police is one matter, and, that, and, and I'm sure police are working towards ensuring that the reports are taken seriously and, and, and um, survivors uh, are supported. But it's really important to also empower some of the women's organizations who over the last few years have been cut down to the bones. And so they're not in a position to empower the women who come to them for support and services. I mean, I'm quite confident, actually, that, you know, over the 10 years I've seen very significant, uh, particularly in, in the Bangladeshi community, a very significant numbers uh, of kind of an you know, awareness campaign, good practice going on. But what is absolutely critical in all this is the empowerment of very large sections of our community overall, the Asian women. If they're well-educated, if they're well, um, you know, economically strong and strengthened, they're not going to be in a position where there's going, they're going to collude or push through their young girls to a forced marriage. And I think that's one of the fundamental questions that we are not 
willing to address. And well, let, let me just put that. Uh, way is not good enough, really. Let me just put that that question um, to Anita. I mean, that, that's a that's a, a serious point, isn't it? That that many of the organisations that would be most vigilant about this, some of who have expressed um, their reservations, um, are facing funding cuts, and and therefore, um, whatever the intention, it, it may look as if. Um, Criminalisation rather than education is is, is what's going to prevail. I think there has to be a continuity of care, and there has to be the support and financial financial there to support the organisation that are looking after the most vulnerable. Uh, and and in your experience, do you think that the, the cuts are impacting on women's organisations, as, as the Baroness was suggesting? Absolutely, they are. Of course, they are. It's, you know. The level of funding has gone down and it's much harder for all the organisations out there. And the work plus has gone up, very steeply gone up and spikingly go up, going up. So that, that is an absolute issue that's going to have to be addressed in order to look after people that, that are coming forward. But one of the things we need to look at in terms of the care that's provided for people to come forward, if it is going to go to a prosecution, a criminal prosecution, that is continuity of care, it's continuity of the police officers that come forward, of the Crown Prosecution Service, victim support, that, that there is a line where people are supported throughout and they're not going to be dropped halfway through. One of the reasons we find a lot of people are reluctant to come forward and when they do come forward, they often go back to the perpetrators is because the type of accommodation they're given and the care they're given after the initial report drops down to being almost non-existent. And that's very difficult because it relies on a few outstanding individuals like Anne-Marie to really take the gauntlet on, pick up the phone in the middle of the night, continually working on things, and there isn't the support mechanism there to ensure that victims are supported all the way through, and that's something that we're going to have to put funding towards. Mm. OK. Um, Anne-Marie, I mean, the, the, obviously that's an important aspect of it. I mean, another aspect I don't, I'd like your opinion on, really, is there's a huge upheaval in the, in the legal system itself now, and austerity driven is that likely to have an impact on this or is um, that well thankfully forced marriage um, is one of the um, areas of law the civil law that's been left in what we call in scope and the government has said that legal aid for victims or, who wish for protection and wish for a civil order under the forced marriage civil protection orders um, are still able to obtain legal aid. But well, I do want to say something. There is a lacuna and it's a, very, a great concern to the women's groups and it's this, that um, I, many of these marriages are valid. They are valid until they are made void as a matter of law. So if they took, especially if they took place overseas. They'll be a valid overseas and they'll be here. So at the end of this whole process, whether there's a prosecution or civil protection, whatever happens, that young person wishes to be put back in the place that they were. They don't want a divorce. They're entitled either to a decree of nullity or to a declaration that the marriage should never have been recognised in the first place. Now, the, the problem with the public funding legal aid at the moment is whilst it is, it is available for nullity applications, it's only available if the last incidents of violence took place in the last 24 months. Um, and many young people do not immediately seek to, to obtain a decree of no Okay, just let me see if I can get floating. Just let me see if I can get you to talk us through that again. So there is a there's a kind of loophole in the removal of legal aid, which means that this will be this, within legal aid. There is an impact about with the changes that came into legal aid in, in the area of nullity, which is because forced marriage isn't just one incident. Mm. Whether it starts with a prosecution, a report to the police, it's a spectrum of behaviour and the various bits to it. And even after the prosecution if the perpetrators are in jail. There's still the victim she may have to, or he may have to move on to college, sort all that out. And part of that is often extracting themselves from the marriage, which is valid. Mm. And there are certain circumstances where public funding is not available for them to do that because they can't meet what is called the gateway criteria mm. for, that the government has laid down. So that's something we certainly, Anita and I, we're going to be looking at. Because we need, it, you need to be able to promise these, pe these young people, if they come forward, yes, if you make this reporting, this is the likely consequences, this is how it will proceed, this is how the police will deal with it, yes. and this is how you will be dealt with through the whole process. Of I mean, Matt, this, this can't be happy listening for you, because, I mean, if, if the women's groups are being cut, if there's, even though there's a degree of protection, some of the funding, legal aid funding, is going to be cut, um, the government's made a big fuss about this being a change in the law, this is heading into your lap, isn't it? It is. Uh, we've got to... 
We've got to bear in mind there's a whole infrastructure around this and, and whilst I accept there's been cutbacks and there, there's vital services that are required, we've also got to remember that actually within the framework we've got safeguarding arrangements that look after minors who aren't adults at the moment and they're quite strong and we're well established. We've also got to bear in mind there's a new victims code that, that came out in December last year which puts the needs of victims right at the heart so they get support throughout all this and we've now got a very powerful criminal law which is any act which which will lead to a person being coerced against their free consent so it's not like we've got to try and find evidence that uh, for substantive offences like we had to before anything that mm -hmm. is coercive so that persuasive that emotional story, that heartfelt plea to them. Anything that coerces against free consent is now a criminal offence. So, 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 so any victim out there who's thinking about should they, shan't they, should they, shouldn't they, it's, your, it's you who have been abused. Please don't get abused. People like me are here, we're well trained, all our frontline officers have been trained, we understand it, we understand what, what you go through, we understand what sort of circumstances you're going to be in. And there's an array of support around that. And now you've got the criminal justice system right behind you. You do not deserve to be forced into a marriage and live like that for the rest of your natural life. That's not on. Mm. I mean, Baron Sudin, I mean, that message is, is, is clear. Um, but do, do you fear that the support mechanisms won't actually be there to sustain a complainant all the way through this process in the conditions that we've been talking about? I think when we were given the feta compli and said that, you know, the law is going to be the law, we understand it's a very strong law. And I think that there's been the whole section, different sections of the community, of the legal profession, the police, the women's organization need to be... The, you know, pay tribute to because they have kept, you know, the issue of forced marriage live uh, in front of people. And I think just as people would, some people would uh, report uh, domestic violence, others would, wouldn't, some people would report child abuse, others wouldn't. In the same context, I do have confidence that those who can and will report, there, there is infrastructures available. And of course, you know, the minors are going to be taken care of because there are very strong rules that support children. What I'm deeply Concerns about concerns about is the adult, and just because we have a powerful law does not lead to the resources. And in all honesty, and this is not a political point, the women's organisations that have supported the government without any questions are the only ones that have received funding. And those who have had any quibbles haven't been funded and or supported. And my final concern is. Yes, the legal process, uh, there might be nullity available and there might be financial support available. But what about people looking to annul the marriages or going to Sharia court? Many individuals are still paying about £400 to get themselves, um, you know, uh, extricated from an Islamic marriage. And I know that the marriage project, which is being led by Aina Khan, is doing some work on it. So I think, you know, we go back to the point that Anne-Marie Hutchinson made in the first instance, that it is a very complex issue. A whole plethora of responses are required. And we mustn't, any one of us, mustn't wash our hands of thinking, OK, it's now illegal and it's going to be done and everything is going to be hunky-dory, which is what the government okay, so just, wanted to do. Just let me stop you there. Now, last word from, from Anita before we move to the break. Anita, do you think that's, uh, uh, do you think that's, that, that, that's true? Baroness Newton is, is suggesting that there's a, a kind of political bias in the funding. I have no idea about that. It's just completely shocking if that is the case. But one of the things we can't forget, and we're all, in all of our minds talking about this today, behind every one of those statistics is a real human tragedy where young girls and boys are treated like slaves, all their human rights and dignity are taken away from them. And we're all on the same page on that. We also want to support those people that come forward. Well, OK, that's a really good point to end the discussion for this part of the programme. But there's much more to say. So come back to us after the break. <laughs> 